Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Journey Church. How are we? All right. Two of y'all are great. All right. Well, as, I, as she said, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4 this morning. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and grab that and uh, turn to that. It's in the Old Testament. We're going to be finishing up the story of Jonah and our series this morning, Mercy Beneath the Waves. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, I just want to welcome you and tell you that we're so glad that you are here. We're honored to, to be able to worship alongside you today. We pray that today's service is a blessing to your heart, that it encourages you, uh, and that you see Jesus more clearly today. That's our prayer for you. And even if it's not your first time, that's our prayer for you too. Uh, so glad to have you here today. Uh, just as a quick recap, as we finish the story of Jonah, I know it's summer, people are in and out every week. Uh, so I just want to give a quick recap of how we got to Jonah 4. Uh, Jonah is a prophet of God who is called to go to Nineveh by God to preach to this massive city in Assyria. And the problem is that Nineveh is a brutal, brutal place. They, the Assyrians were very cruel. In fact, they were historically cruel and they were a neighbor of Israel, a threat to be sure, and Jonah doesn't like them. They're violent and unjust, and so instead of going to Nineveh like God tells him to, he runs the opposite direction, boards a ship to Tarshish, which is hard to say, um, and God doesn't let him off the hook that easy. So God pursues Jonah through sending a storm on the sea, and Jonah is cast overboard, and basically God provides this huge ship, or ship, huge fish to swallow Jonah. And there in the fish, Jonah has a, I guess you could call it a come to Jesus meeting. And he prays for God to save him from the belly of the fish and God does. And so Jonah goes on to Nineveh and preaches what God tells him to, which is that in 40 days, Nineveh is gonna be overthrown. It's really a very short sermon, very succinct and very effective because something remarkable happens. Nineveh repents of their violence and their wickedness and they ask God, for mercy, but surely God can't just give mercy, but yet he does. God grants them mercy. They don't get what they deserve. And we finish the book of Jonah today by being let in on this revealing dialogue between Jonah and God. Jonah is plagued with anger and confusion over God's dealing so mercifully with the people of Nineveh. And we live in a culture today that struggles with mercy as well. It's somewhat foreign to us. Yes, you can find mercy in different places in our culture, but it's pretty foreign to us to just offer mercy to people. Because at the heart of our cancel culture is this idea that there are certain things, there are some things that are too bad, there are lines that if crossed, will take a person past the cultural point of return. We are all, and we probably all in some ways, have been judged by the court of public opinion. The very actions that we banish or that we cancel people over are often not even like actual crimes, but can just be something that's a lot less consequential. We have no mercy for each other over differing views on sexuality. We have no mercy for each other over differing views on politics and who you voted for. We have no mercy over differing views on social issues like abortion or marriage or gender or racial reconciliation or it goes on and on and on. We have no mercy for people that disagree with us. And I'm not saying there aren't real injustices taking place. But what I am saying is that we are becoming more merciless by the hour. And these are not just happening. These are things that are not just happening in New York City or LA or Chicago or Dallas. These are happening where we live in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Mercilessness has infected our entire society. Relationships are canceled. Sometimes relationships that have gone on for decades over who you voted for, or over a disagreement, over a belief. We live in a world, too, where information and opinions are coming at us constantly. We don't just hear it, we're ingesting this data, news, and opinions all day long, and it's forming us into a people in our society who look at others who are not in our tribe with utter contempt. Through 24-7 news loops, or social media on the, in the internet, which is always on, we're always on alert and always being discipled into kind of an us versus them mentality. And unfortunately, one of the devastating pro byproducts of this mentality is we've lost the capability of showing mercy to them. You make a mistake, 
or you disagree with me on a closely held belief, or you confront my identity and you are written off. But here's the problem for us who are disciples of Jesus, if that's what you would call yourself in the room today, if this is the air we breathe, if this is how we see things, how on earth can we as God's people not fall into this pattern of mercilessness? Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy, Matthew 5, 7. Mercy is a valued uh, asset in the kingdom of God. But how can we realistically love our enemies when we're being shaped into a posture of condemnation on those we disagree with? Or worse, how are we to be able to show mercy to someone who's actually really hurt us? This is not far from where Jonah's at. Even though this happened like 2,600 years ago, he had much contempt for his enemies, the Ninevites. He wanted them canceled. He wanted them destroyed, but they weren't. And as close as we close out this story today, let's examine this dialogue between God and Jonah and let's see if it might give us a solution to the own mercilessness that we find sometimes in our hearts. And so to do that, we're going to notice first the merciless heart. We're going to see the merciful counselor. And then we're going to look at the healing salve of the steadfast love of God. So that's a mouthful. The merciless heart, the merciful counselor, and the healing salve of the Lord's steadfast love. So let's pick it up as Morgan did there at the end of chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. On first reading, this actually doesn't make that much sense when you think about it. Like this is a preacher who just preached a sermon and everyone repented. Now, I haven't been preaching that long, but I think that would be pretty awesome, right? And not just a few people came forward. This is like a every head bowed, every eye closed, one of those things where the pastor then said, like, if you've made a decision for Jesus, look up at me. And like 120,000 people look up at him. That's pretty amazing. So why did this displease Jonah so much? Well, we actually probably shouldn't be too surprised if we've been reading Jonah carefully. He's been giving us clues all along that this might be the case. If you go back to chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Jonah's engagement with the sailors in the ship. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. Here's what they say. This is the sailors talking to Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? These are identity questions. That's what they are. Questions you might ask someone that you just met at work or out shopping or a friend introduces you to or at a ball game. What do you do? Are you from here? Basically, who are you? What is your identity? And what it's telling is that the order of the questions they asked and the order in which Jonah answered, because really they ask about five questions and Jonah pretty much just answers one, the ethnicity question. Look at what he says in verse nine. He answered, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Think about your Instagram or your Twitter accounts, the bio section. What do you list there? What comes to your mind first? Because often what we say about our identity initially is what actually we think defines us. They ask him five questions. He answers one, I'm a Hebrew. He sums up his identity first and foremost as a Hebrew. And therefore, as we all know, whatever threatens his identity is going to feel the force of his wrath. The Ninevites were a threat to Israel. They were cruel, they were oppressive, and they were unjust. And more than a, you don't see from him as a worshiper of Yahweh, you don't see him list that he's a prophet, more than a worshiper of Yahweh, more than a prophet who speaks for God, more than a man whose occupation was to go and share God's grace and compassion with, with whoever God calls him to, Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew. That would be us, like us answering that question, I'm an American. 
This was his identity. This is what he thought defined him. He was nationalistic first and foremost. And that's just the first clue. Now, some of you may be thinking like, yeah, okay, he said that in chapter one, but you remember the whole thing with the fish and not sure how that works, but you know, he was there. He repented, right? Yes, he did. But even in his prayer in chapter two, there's a clue of a still merciless heart. Look at chapter two, verses eight and nine. This is in the middle of Jonah's prayer. Look at what he says. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Why in the middle of Jonah's prayer of repentance does he make a one-off comment about idols? Where does that come from? Because from what we can deduce, I mean, he's a... Hebrew, he worships the God of Israel. He's not worshiping idols. And he even basically says as much in verse nine, where he contrasts himself as the one with those who is, that worship idols. He basically says like, those who worship idols turn away from God's steadfast love. But me, man with sacrifices, praise and faithfulness, I cling to the Lord for salvation. This is self-righteousness in his heart, even in the midst of repentance. While asking for grace and admitting he was wrong to run from God, Jonah was almost still kind of positioning himself before God as though even now he was not quite as bad as the people that God was about to send him to. It's as if he was saying, you're sending me to those idol worshipers. Just keep in mind, they have forsaken their steadfast love of yours, Lord. You don't show them love. But me, no, no, not me. I love you. I will complete my vows. It is self-righteousness, and it's easy for us to do too. Think about how you might look at others sometimes. Like oftentimes we mask our self-righteousness with at best maybe half-hearted concern for those far from God or who have made a mess of their life. But sometimes deep down, we really enjoy looking down at people who we think we're better than because it makes us feel justified. It's self-righteousness. And the challenge of Jonah's prayer in chapter two is that it is theologically accurate in its content, but it shows a heart of self-righteousness with roots that are deep. It's like weeds in your yard. I was walking outside to check our mail yesterday. I guess all the rain, we finally got, you know, not just green grass, but a lot of weeds. Uh, not a lot of weeds, but some weeds. And so, you know, like you look at your yard, you've got weeds growing, you can mow over them, right? Or you can go grab them and, and pull them out. But typically, at least depending on the weed, a lot of times all you're able, really able to do is pull out like what you actually see. And they come back in no time, oftentimes quicker than your grass, taller than the healthy grass around them, because you didn't actually get to the root of the weed. And you know that all weeds are different. Like sometimes the two couple I pulled yesterday, they pulled right up, root and all with a small little tug, but sometimes, sometimes the roots are so deep, you have to take a shovel to dig them out. And Jonah's self-righteousness was deep. Despite the fact that he knew he was wrong for running from God, even in his prayer, there's a clue of that God's merciful storm and God's merciful fish didn't fully uproot the self-righteousness in Jonah's heart and only ripped up the outward evidence for a moment. Because in one chapter later, the weeds are back. Which brings us to where we are in the story. God relents of the destruction of Nineveh, praise God. And it seems wrong to Jonah. The actual Hebrew word here translated wrong or displeased is a word that is a verb that typically means bad or evil. So think about that for a second. Jonah thought that God did an evil thing, an evil thing in showing mercy to the Ninevites. But he didn't think God was evil to show mercy to him. Why is that? Because he wasn't self-aware. Or put negatively, he was self-unaware. He was blind to the amount of mercy and grace he both needed and received from God. He gushed about how salvation is from the Lord in chapter 2, 9, but he's angry about the mercy of God to a pagan nation. 
So notice how he follows it up in verse 2 of chapter 4. It says that he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew you would do something like this. Even before Jonah left Israel to flee to Tarshish, he knew of God's grace, his compassion, and his abounding and steadfast love. How could he have known it? Because he experienced it personally. And Israel experienced it as a nation. Jonah knew God's character, and he didn't want to see his enemies experience that same thing. Jonah would have rather seen them decimated with God's justice. So to sum up his merciless heart, Jonah's nationalism was his primary identity, his justification for life was his self-righteousness, and he was unaware of his own need for grace himself. The culmination, brothers and sisters, of a primary identity for us that is found in something other than God and self-righteousness in our hearts, righteousness that's not from God, is a merciless heart. It's how we get there. So what is the fruit of this merciless heart? Verse three, now, Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. Despair, disillusionment. Those are the fruits of a merciless heart. Why? Because it's the natural result of what Jonah's dealing with his identity and his righteousness were not as stable as he thought. How come? Because by God showing mercy and compassion on a pagan nation, it revealed to Jonah that he built his identity on an, at best an incomplete understanding of what it meant to be a Hebrew and his justification for life didn't entitle him to look down on others like he thought it did. And when much of what you and I think we know about life is upended, despair and disillusionment is a natural result of that. And my guess is that you guys resonate with this, because I do. If we're honest with ourselves, we see Jonah's response to God both as like shocking and horrible and familiar. I mean, I've alluded throughout this series that we all struggle when God loves our enemies. We naturally show mercy to those that we love and we naturally show, show mercy to those people that we understand. Struggle with envy? Well, you're likely to be merciful to others who do too. Struggle with pride? I mean, I don't, but maybe y'all do. You're likely merciful to others who struggle with pride. Struggle with anger, lust, unwholesome talk, addiction, you name it you will likely be more merciful to those who struggle with those things that you do. But what about people who are not like you? Whose identity are other than you or maybe who's even the way they define themselves is an affront to you. Do you show them mercy? It's a bit harder. What about people who aren't, you know, as righteous as you are? Struggle to show them mercy? Maybe. Often, like Jonah, where we are aware enough of ourselves to see our need for grace, we're able to offer grace and mercy to others. But where we're not self-aware, where we are self-unaware of our need for grace, we withhold mercy from others. And a merciless heart is a cold and hard heart. But God goes to work on it. Look at verse 4. How exactly does he work on this merciless heart? Does God explode in righteous anger at his prophet? Does he shame him for being so self-unaware? Does the Lord express frustration at the slowness of Jonah's sanctification? My goodness, a storm of fish. What, what does a God got to do around here? No, instead of the storm, this time he engages him like a counselor. Instead of like a demolition machine taking a wrecking ball to the hardness of Noah's, or Jonah's heart, God engages Jonah like a surgeon in a scheduled operation, carefully taking Jonah's heart in his hands. Verse four, but the Lord replied, 
Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right? This is a question of God's justice for Noah, or for Jonah. I don't know why I said that. Is it right, Jonah? And we know, those of us in the room that are parents, sometimes, especially if you're like me, maybe I'm the only one, it's easier to come in with the storm. Like, kid acts out, it's easier to be like, here comes the storm, better prepare yourself, go to your room, I'm, you know, I'm going to lay, lay everything out on the table for you. And it's easier sometimes because one, it's acting in the flesh, it doesn't take much thought. And number two, it's because you might get an immediate result, which is, might be quiet, which might be the back talk stops, or whatever the case may be. We know that to actually engage the heart of a child takes a lot longer time, a lot slower results but it's the right thing to do. It bears fruit in the long run. We know this as parents, and like a good father, God engages Jonah's heart with a question. But Jonah continues down the path of resistance. Verse five, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. This may expose my age a little bit, um, but does anybody remember the show Full House? Yes? Okay. Now, some of you may be like Fuller House. I mean, I didn't even watch Fuller House. Uh, I've seen enough Hallmark to see I don't need any more Fuller House. But what I remember as a kid, at about the same time every episode, like maybe minute 23, 24 in the 30-minute episode, one of the girls, either DJ or, or Deej, uh, Stephanie, or one of the Michelles, uh, gets upset. She gets upset, they've either made a mistake, someone's hurt them, and either their dad or Uncle Joey or Uncle Jesse or maybe their aunt will say the same phrase every time, I'll go talk to her. I just remember that as a kid being like, that's just kind of an odd thing to do, but okay. And they do, and they go upstairs in the room and they're crying and they're sad and they talk to her and resolution comes and anyone else's conversations go with your kids like that? I could tell by the laughter that it's not probably the same for you. And it's not the same typically for me when they, when they were younger. It's just not realistic. And so here the Lord gently calls out Jonah's merciless heart. And so what happens? Do we cue the sappy music? Will Jonah confess and hug it out with God? No. God's question falls on deaf ears. Instead, Jonah decides that maybe God will come to his senses and wipe those scoundrels off the map like they deserve. See, this merciless heart is stubborn. Jonah, he's just not getting it yet because the merciless roots are deep. So the Lord has to take him on a journey. And so we pick up in verse six where he says, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. You can imagine some of the self-talk Jonah probably had right now. The plant grows up, finally something goes right. This shade is at least a little pleasant. Thank you, Lord. Like maybe you're finally seeing who the good guy is in this situation. It's about time. Next day, the plant dies. Of course it didn't last. One more thing, I can't catch a break. What is the deal in this place? Why would God do such a thing? I mean, he's teaching him something. Why would he do it like that? Because God cares about the heart of Jonah too much to just leave him be. Jonah brushed off the first question. So in his kindness, the Lord takes Jonah on a journey to reveal how misplaced the mercy that he did have in his heart was. So the Lord, after this, comes to him with a similar question. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? 
It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. The fruit of a merciless heart, despair, disillusionment. Jonah's heart is fully laid bare before himself and his God. But how does the Lord connect Jonah's heart to reality? If all he does is expose Jonah's heart, then he may be a good counselor, but he's not a merciful counselor. He may have been gentle with Noah in the questions, but the plant was like taking a scalpel to Jonah's heart. That one cut deep. So how is this merciful of God? How is he possibly a merciful counselor to Jonah and to us? Because when the Lord pursues us, he often bypasses the injustice in our hands to address the injustice in our hearts. Why is that? Because in the scriptures, the heart is not a part of who we are. It is what animates all of our lives. It's our emotions, our hopes, our dreams, our desires. Jesus says it's from our hearts that our mouths speak. Like what we say comes from our heart. It's from what's inside us in our hearts that defiles us. That's what Jesus says. Not what we put in our mouth, but what comes out. So naturally, God would be after our hearts. And Jonah had what St. Augustine called an inward curve of the heart. The human heart naturally curves in on itself. It does not curve outward toward God and others naturally because of sin in the world and sin in our hearts Apart from grace, we all have a misshapen, inward curved heart. Jonah had that, and we will all have that apart from grace. You see, God is not after your outward morality first and foremost, because you know what? Jonah was probably pretty moral, much more moral than the Ninevites. But Jonah's heart was merciless. It hadn't been transformed by God's grace. He could say that he's seen God's grace, He can even say he's experienced God's grace, but his heart had not been transformed by God's grace. It was hard and it needed softening so that he could actually receive the grace. It needed healing from the surgeon-like cuts the Lord had made with the plant and by showing mercy to Nineveh. It needed the softening and healing salve of God's steadfast love. What Jonah said he knew about God in verse two, about him being slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, gracious and compassionate, that is actually what God was doing in him all along, showing him compassion, showing him patience, showing him steadfast love. And that is why the only way this story can end is not only with the exposing of Jonah's heart, but the exposing of God's heart. Look at the way it finishes, 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? The Lord says, Jonah, Look at your heart. Jonah, look at your heart. But if that was all he said, that'd be pretty hopeless. But then he says, Jonah, look at my heart. The Lord shows Jonah's disordered affection and compassion. He does have compassion in him and concern, but it was for the plant that he didn't even grow. So why shouldn't God have compassion for 120,000 people and animals that he did create and make? And more than that, who were spiritually blind. They didn't know their right hand from their left. 
This doesn't excuse their sin. God clearly was going to send judgment on their sin, but what it does show is the depth of God's patient heart. This is a God of great compassion, of great mercy, a God of steadfast love for all that he has made, the pagan and the religious, the righteous and the unrighteous, you, your friends, and your enemies. This is the God of Scripture. And brothers and sisters, this is the God who sent Jesus. At the climax of his steadfast love, so that by faith we who were dead, not just blind, dead in our transgressions can be made alive with him. We who were enemies of God can now be called friends of God, sons and daughters of the king. So what about our merciless hearts? This side of the cross, we are given new hearts by God. Hearts that are not curved inward, but are being reshaped by the gospel to love those in our world who can't tell their right hand from their left and who are blind and need to see. So we don't look at them with disdain or with angst. Not only do we not, we can't. We can't look at them that way because we are just like them apart from grace. And because like God was teaching Jonah, we are all in need of grace and compassion. What every human heart needs is to, be, is to experience the steadfast love of the God who made them. And this means like just in chapter one, with Jonah and the sailors, the story of Jonah is God is showing us that we're all in the same boat facing the same storm of our sin and we're all in need of his rescue. And only Jesus Christ can rescue you and me from the storm of our sin by faith in him. And Jonah shows us that. But one of the things Jonah, Jonah teaches us as we close the, the, uh, the book is that in this process of our hearts being reshaped, at, at our growing from merciless hearts to merciful hearts, God is incredibly patient. Tim Keller says it like this, we learn from Jonah that understanding God's grace and being changed by it always requires a long journey with successive stages. So take heart, brothers and sisters, because the path to a merciful and softened heart may be arduous at times, it might even hurt at times, but God is more committed to it than you and he will accomplish what he sets forth to accomplish in your heart. The end of Jonah is pretty abrupt. I mean, when she read it earlier, you might've been like, wait, is that the end? That's how it ends? Should I not have compassion on all these people and animals? That's it? Like, what happened? Did Jonah repent? Did his heart ever soften? We don't entirely know. But Sinclair Ferguson says this about the end of Jonah. Here's how he says, and this is how I want to finish. He said, it carries no conclusion because it summons us to write the final paragraph. It remains unfinished in order that we might provide our own conclusion to its message. For you are Jonah, and I am Jonah. You are Jonah, and I am Jonah. And we are beckoned by the scriptures to finish the chapter. So how do you finish it? Tim Keller remarks about it this way. He says, the question at the end of Jonah seems to be like God has drawn an arrow back and he's aiming it at Jonah's heart and then it's over. Jonah disappears, the story ends and what we realize is that arrow is aimed at our heart. And the arrow from God, the arrow from the Lord is this question. Brother, sister, look at your heart. Now look at my heart. 
shouldn't yours be more like mine? Shouldn't you love the souls of men and women who are spiritually blind more than your plants or your possessions or your comfort or your little man-made identities? So the call to action today for us is just to let the Lord's arrow pierce your heart this morning and then allow him to be your merciful counselor. Is your heart merciless? Is it turned inward? Because the way of healing and the way of changing your heart is not more commitment, but more wonder. The way to change and transform your heart is not more commitment, but more wonder at the steadfast love of God that he's made real to you in the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that the way we're transformed, first of all, is by one degree at a time. It's not fast, typically. And it's by beholding the glory of God. That's the way we change. So I ask you, behold the glorious and steadfast love of God for you in Jesus Christ today. Study it, meditate on it, rejoice in it, and apply the salve of the Lord's steadfast love given to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ and watch this Lord of compassion and steadfast love slowly but surely transform your heart into a merciful heart like his. Let's pray together and then we'll sing. As we pray, I just would ask for you to, I know sometimes it's hard, but to ask for you to, to embrace the silence for the Lord to speak through his spirit to you. As I mentioned the very first week we did this, like we all have people that have hurt us and sometimes those are the people that we just really have a hard time showing mercy to. So if the Lord has brought those people uh, or past events to your mind throughout this series, I just ask that now you would, if you haven't already, that you would deal with the Lord about that in your heart. It's not to say that we should be run over by people or that we are just helpless, but just to say that bitterness is gonna kill you and it's gonna rob you of joy that you can have in Jesus to let him be the one to handle some of those hurts. So just pray now, listen to the Lord and let him apply his love to your heart. Our Father, we need your love. We need a love that we can't lose. We need an identity that is not achieved but received from you. We need just a righteousness that we cannot attain. So we're so incredibly grateful that you would provide a way to you, that you would provide us an identity as your son and daughter, fully loved forever. And that you would provide a righteousness in Jesus Christ, a righteousness not of our own, so that those who are not in you are not less than us. They just need to know you. They need to see you. Let us see you today and transform our hearts that we would be a counterculture, a place in which mercy happens and is given and is received for the glory of your name. Amen.